joining us. Sure. So the first question is, where are we now? We keep hearing these reports about a Russian convoy coming into the capital city, et cetera, et cetera. But big picture, where is the war as of tonight? Well, the first five days, we witnessed a very slow, methodical movement of Russian forces into eastern Ukraine. That is Ukraine, the third of Ukraine, which is on the eastern side of this river called the Dnieper. They moved slowly, cautiously. They tried to reduce casualties among the civilian population, tried to give as many Ukrainian troops and forces as possible the opportunity to give up, to surrender. That is over. And the phase in which we find ourselves now Russian forces have now maneuvered to encircle and surround the remaining Ukrainian forces and destroy them through a series of massive rocket artillery strikes, air strikes, with Russian armor then slowly but surely closing the distance and annihilating what's left. So this is, a, this is the beginning, frankly, of the end of Ukrainian resistance. So the ugly stuff is just beginning, it yes. sounds like. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so this is a question you don't often hear asked, but it's essential to our welfare here in the United States, to our strategic thinking about this. What is Putin's goal here? What's his aim? Well, I think Vladimir Putin set out to honor his word of 2007. 2007 at the Munich Security Conference, he said, we will not tolerate the expansion of NATO into to a point where your NATO, your border, is touching Russia specifically Ukraine and Georgia. We see these as essentially Trojan horses for NATO's military power and U.S. influence, subversion, and so forth. He then turned to several opportunities to reinforce that over and over and over again, most recently with President Biden, in the hopes that he could avoid taking action to effectively clean out eastern Ukraine of any opposition forces whatsoever, and to put his forces in a position vis-a-vis -vis NATO to deter us from any further attempts to influence or change Ukraine into effectively a platform for the projection of U.S. and Western power into Russia. Now his goal, as we see it at the moment, is to seize this entire area of eastern Ukraine. That's pretty clear. He's going to roll up to that river up near Kiev. He has actually moved over the river and is preparing to go in and capture that city entirely. At that point, he has to decide what else he wants to do. I don't think he wants to go any further west. I think he'd be very satisfied to hold that point. But he would like whatever emerges from this that we call Ukraine, whether it's just the western side or it encompasses some of the, both the east and the west of Ukraine, to be neutral, non-aligned, and preferably friendly to Moscow. That he will accept. Anything short of that, his war has been a waste of time. How should the United States respond at this point? Well, I think President Biden and Sullivan, his national security advisor, have already given some indication of their readiness to accept something like that. They're not going to have any choice. Either they accept it or then they put him in the position of having to do more than he would like to do, which would probably not go down well with NATO. No one really wants Russian forces on their border, least of all Poland. Right. So I think Sullivan and Biden will essentially tell Zelensky, if he is still the president at that point, and if he's still running any semblance of the Ukrainian government, which is largely collapsing now, if he is still there, he's going to be told, accept the deal, go neutral, because there really is no choice. You are hearing elements in the United States Congress, it's almost unanimous in the media, calling on the Biden administration to enforce a so-called no-fly zone over mm -hmm. Ukraine. It, what would be the effect of that? Well, you'd end up at war with Russia because the Russians are not going to allow Western aircraft, U.S. aircraft flying over the battlefield in eastern Ukraine under any circumstances. As Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, flew to Poland to stop the Poles from essentially offering MiG-29 aircraft that were improved and modernized to the Ukrainians, allowing their pilots to come to Poland, fly these into Ukraine. He put a stop to it saying that anything like that could lead to war and NATO will not go to war. And see, this is the interesting part. Now everyone is talking about spending lots of money on defense and lots of money for NATO, but very shortly people are going to begin to ask why. Why are we doing? Because it's patently obvious that NATO is not in a position to fight, not in a position to challenge the Russians. So I think Mr. Biden's problem tonight is not just 
his narrative is going to break down very rapidly over the next few days as it becomes obvious that this whole Ukraine business was a fantasy on his part. He, he's going to end up trying to write checks that he can't cash because we can't afford a massive military. We can't afford to put more forces forward. And if we try to do it, it'll be self-defeating. So I think we're in a real crisis now that no one has really, really figured out yet, and that is NATO itself and our position on the European continent. All of this is now at risk. I think a lot of people were taken by surprise by this invasion. I'll admit that I was also, mm -hmm. not that, of course, we're experts on Eastern Europe. But the president and his team had said for weeks, in effect, we've got this under control, we have applied enough pressure on the Russians that it would be very unwise for them to do this. That was a massive miscalculation, obviously. Uh, how did they screw up? Well, two things. I think that Mr. Putin has priced in the cost. In other words, he's not a fool. He sat down with Xi in Beijing and made it very clear what he was going to do, what his goals were in eastern Ukraine and only eastern Ukraine initially. And I think he got, he got the conditions he wanted from Xi of support and assistance through this process because he knew what we would try to do to him. We would try to destroy Russia financially, economically, in whatever way we could. So we've just created a, like a real alliance between Russia and China, or in any effect, there now is one. Oh, there's like. a real strategic partnership. There's no question about it, because China needs Russia in order to secure Central Asia and all the routes to Europe. China wants to do business with Europe. That's why the Chinese would like Mr. Putin to end this quickly. But Putin insisted on those first five days slowing things down because he wanted to minimize damage to property and he wanted to minimize the loss of life, particularly upon a, in the population that he was trying to bring into effectively a new Ukraine that is Russian. Uh, he's, he's essentially discarded that now. So I just wanna be absolutely clear on this point because a lot hangs on it. So many of our leaders are beholden to Russia, have gotten rich from Russia, Joe Biden's family, Nancy Pelosi's family, I mean, pick one, they all have. Yes. Putin would not have been able to do what he did, invade Ukraine, without the support of China. It sounds like what you're saying. I think that's absolutely true. If China, if China had not reassured him, we will stay the course with you, I doubt seriously that he would be doing this now. So since everyone is in moral outrage mode and screaming the F word at each other on Twitter, I wonder why China's not included in their outrage. Well, that's, a, that's a, an important question that deserves a great answer, but I'm going to let you take that one on. I'm not going to go there tonight. Doug McGregor.